so you don't have a representative right now, so right now um, you're talking directly to me with anything to do with girls' ministries. And I was speaking to Pastor John earlier just to kind of get a point of reference of where you're at, and I understand that over a period of time you've had kind of ebbs and flows in girls' ministries here at Penyan. So I just really want to encourage you tonight and kind of help you see the direction that we want to see churches go in girls' ministries, what we believe is a godly model, um, what we believe is a mentoring model, and the idea of what Titus 2 really is. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight. And I'm going to read, uh, first of all, from Titus chapter 2, verse 2, or I'm sorry, verse 1, 1 through 6. And you don't have to turn there. I'll read, and uh, you can look it up later. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. But as for you, promote the kind of living that reflects right teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have strong faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that is appropriate for someone serving the Lord. They must not go around speaking evil of others and must not be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and to be pure, to take care of their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely in all they do. This is the basic concept and the basic precept that girls' ministries and Royal Rangers are built upon, the idea of a godly woman mentoring a girl and the idea of a godly man mentoring a boy. And so when we talk about that, we, I, we just think, well, why just girls? You know, we have kids' ministries in most of our churches. We have Sunday school. We have children's church. We have kids' church. We have adventure kids. We have uh, VBS. We have all these things. Why just girls? Why is it that we want women to mentor girls? I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about something called gender-specific ministry, which is kind of like a long term for women teaching girls. Uh, so when I talk about gender-specific ministry, that's really a huge heartbeat of mine, is women mentoring girls. Gender-specific ministry is crucial for developing girls into women of God. We see it here in the Word of God. We see it modeled throughout Scripture. You know, girls are faced with so much confusion and temptation today, and when you bring girls to a place that's catered to them, where you as women can connect with them as a mentor, and you can invest in them, they can discover the answers to the questions that they face. So that's the idea behind women mentoring girls and developing a relationship with them. And I just want to talk a little bit about just the nuts and bolts of why we need that kind of ministry. And I know probably you know this in this room, but I'm going to speak a little bit, first of all, from an educated stand, an educator standpoint. I am not an educator. I just went in my other life. I'm a nurse, and I manage a family practice office, so I tend to look things at things through two different lenses. Uh, I look at it from the girls' ministries end, and I look at it from the developmental end um, and the things that I see in a family practice office, but I want to talk tonight a little, about, a little bit about learning. First of all, girls learn differently than boys. Have any of you had the experience of teaching a Sunday school class of about the fourth grade level where you have girls and boys in the same room? And you notice immediately that girls and boys do not learn the same way. And if you teach in the public or even the private school system, or if you're a homeschooler, you notice immediately that boys and girls do not learn the same way. Girls are more about a process. They want to know how we're learning. Boys want to know what am I going to get at the end of this lesson, right? It's process versus goal. So we have that learning styles are different. We also have relationship versus accomplishment. Girls enjoy relationship as they're learning. They enjoy relationship with their teacher or their mentor. They enjoy relationship with the other people in the room. Boys want to get straight to whatever it is and how can I be the first one to get there or the best one, right? They're competitive. How versus what? I noticed I... Was, I was just telling the story. For a period of time, I was the, one of the Royal Rangers commanders in our, in our church, which is kind of ironic because I'm the girls' ministries director, but it was just one of those things that was a need. And I noticed very quickly the boys would come in and they'd say, what are we doing tonight? What are we doing tonight? What are we learning tonight? What's our, what's our lesson tonight? What are we doing? Are we going to build a fire? Are we going to burn something down? Are we going to kill something? What are we doing tonight? 
But the girls would come in, and they would want to touch things and feel them, look and see what was set up in the room. They would notice if I had made something pretty, uh, especially when I was a prims teacher. They would always notice those things. So it's how versus what. So from a nuts and bolts standpoint, you're looking at their different learning styles. They just learn differently. The next thing is girls have specific needs. And I want to hang out here a minute on love and acceptance. This is a huge piece for girls. It's a piece for us as women. We have a huge felt need for love and acceptance, don't we? This is why girls in today's society are making the decisions that we're seeing them make. Um, they do not necessarily feel loved and accepted for who they are. We as women have to drill down to the fact that we, in Christ, are loved and accepted. And once we come to that point, we can impart that to the girls that we're mentoring. If we can teach them at an early age as women who know that we are grounded in Christ, we know that our foundation is in him and in his love for us. If we can impart that to them and they can walk into our classrooms and feel loved and accepted immediately, not for what they look like that day, not for how much they weigh, not for how smart they are, not for what they can do, but for who they are in Christ. That is a huge piece for a girl. And it also impacts her learning. If a girl does not feel accepted or loved by the educator, she will have problems learning. So that is a huge piece. Boys, that's a piece, but it's not like it is for a girl. And you'll notice sometimes your more attention-seeking girls, those are the girls who are struggling with their self-worth and their self-esteem. So if we as women as educators in girls' ministries and as mentors can drill down to the fact of who we are in Christ and impart that in our girls, imagine the heartache we can save them down the road. They won't make the decisions to go into relationships that are detrimental. They won't worry so much about their appearance that they're making decisions that are destructive to their bodies. You know, we see girls all the time. It's not any different in Syracuse where I live compared to Penyan or Bath. We see girls who are making decisions about what they put into their bodies, what they allow being done to their bodies, what kind of relationships they put themselves in, what kind of danger they put themselves in, all because they don't feel loved and accepted. So if we're able to impart that to them. Also, identity with other women. Little girls will pick something about you that they can identify with, that they either see in you or that you see in them, and they'll relate to that in you. For me, when I was a little girl, I had a teacher. Her name was Miss Rachel, and she was my Sunday school teacher when I lived in Mississippi. And I identified with her ability to cook and make food really good um, because I liked, I liked to cook. My mom taught me how to cook and how to bake at an early age. And so I identified with that in her, and I developed a relationship with her, and she really cared about us as kids. Now, this was not a gender-specific uh, model. We didn't have girls' clubs and boys' clubs. I went to an independent church when I was a little girl in Mississippi, but she loved um, the girls in that class, and she would take us to her house, and she would teach us how to bake a cake and how to frost a cake, and I identified with that in her, and I looked at her as a, a model to me, and I still remember that and I was 9 or 10 at that time, and now I'm not. And um, so girls will identify with other women. They seek that identity because they want to know what they're going to look like when they're older. You know, you remember being a little girl and thinking about what you were going to be like as a mommy, as a wife? What was your wedding dress going to look like? I used to spend time as a tween. I remember drawing what my wedding dress was going to look like. Um, and actually that had a huge impact on what my wedding dress did look like. And, and I used to think about what I would want my house to look like and what kind of flowers I would plant. They want to identify with a woman. Think for a minute what you were like as a little girl and, and remember some of those identity things. And they want connection and communication. Women like to communicate. I am an oversharer. I am an over-communicator. I like to communicate. If something's happening in my life, I like to communicate it. I like to communicate with those around me. I like to talk to people. I like to network with people. Most little girls like to communicate, and they like to connect with each other. And so they're able to do that in a girl's classroom with women teaching them. And of course, on a spiritual aspect, we have the Titus II concept. We have the mentoring concept, where you as a woman who is desiring to follow Jesus have little duckling girls behind you showing them how to follow Jesus. Now, that's not saying that we're perfect. We're not. 
That's not saying that we have it all figured out. None of us do. But that's saying that I'm walking this road. Walk with me. Having a relationship with that girl and mentoring and discipling them. Um, also having women and girls together and, and boys and, and men together, you remove some of the distractions. Um, not just the distraction of girls flirting with boys, because girls tend to mature earlier and they do tend to flirt with boys before boys have any idea what's going on there. But just the distraction of the competition, you know. And I've done it. I've turned the boys against the girls multiple times when I was a, a Sunday school teacher. Let's see if the boys can yell louder than the girls. And you can use that to your advantage, but sometimes in a classroom that can become very distracting, the competition between the girls and the boys and the flirting and the little bit of that silly distraction. That's totally gone. Also, you can have conversations when it's women mentoring girls that you cannot have in a mixed classroom setting. You simply cannot have those conversations, whether it be um, about hygiene, body odor, um, and, and puberty, and adolescence, and dating, and sexuality. Those are conversations that we should be having in the church. We need to have those conversations. We can't assume that our children are comfortable in knowing what God's word says about these things. We're better for them to hear God's voice on who they are as women and how to be pure young women, not just their bodies being pure, but their minds being pure. And if their minds are pure, then their bodies will be pure. So those are conversations that we can have in those club room settings. I remember as a teenager uh, growing up in, a, in an AG church, all I ever heard about was don't do this and don't do that and this is bad and stay away from this. And nobody in the church ever had a conversation with me about why and what that meant and that, that it was just, you know, you wait until you get married. Well, then what? You know, those, <laughs> those conversations never took place. I was just in Ohio earlier this week. Uh, what day is today? Sunday. Uh, Monday and Tuesday, I was, Sunday night and Monday and Tuesday, I was in Ohio at the National Girls Ministries Conference, and I roomed with the new um, director from New Jersey, and she was telling me about this young woman that she had mentored um, and spent some time with, and they had had these conversations, um, but the whole conversation hadn't been able to happen because in the home there was a different view of sexuality and so this girl was very confused and she's struggling a little bit so we were talking about this but I said to her I said Anna just imagine if you didn't have any voice in her life at all if all she was getting was that view from home um, where anything goes and it doesn't matter and it's just it's it's just your body you know it's it's not anything to do with your heart or your mind or who you are so I said you know you're having a huge impact on her life by talking about these things and explaining that your your heart is connected to your body and these things go together. So these are connect, these are our conversations that aren't going to take place or shouldn't be taking place in a mixed group. Not to that extent. Um, you can't have those conversations. So those are things that can happen in a gender-specific classroom. And then there are challenges, and we were talking about these challenges earlier. Sometimes you have people resource challenges uh, when you're separating the boys and the girls. When you have the boys and the girls together, you can often have one leader with one helper, and you can make it work. Um, but when you separate them out, you do have some challenges, and so that's one of the things that I'm willing to help you with. Um, looking at strategically making it work so that you can still have that relationship with the girls uh, even if you're limited on your people resources um, and leaders developing leaders I have resources for you there I don't ever want somebody to feel like they're not resourced and they don't have what they need to minister to girls so I have some resources for you materials um, that's another challenge and I'll talk a little bit about materials but not a lot I'll talk a little bit but I believe, at, at least in Penyon, you have your materials, right? You're kind of comfortable with that. But there are things that are coming for you that are even better. So um, that's often a challenge. And then relevance and interest. How do we make this relevant to girls? How do we keep them interested? We were talking about that earlier, that it seems like sometimes kids will go to the next big thing that's fun. Um, so we want to kind of talk about that challenge a little bit. So just a little bit about girls' ministries, talking about that. Um, you know, we're about intentional outreach and Christian discipleship for girls. Um, 
one of the reasons why Pastor John asked me to come tonight was when I presented in January to the presbytery meeting, I really spoke about the piece about intentional outreach and Christian discipleship. In today's culture, as I spoke earlier, girls really need role models, and they really need women who will have a relationship with them. Whatever that looks like for you in your church needs to be a big piece of what you're doing in ministry to girls. I encourage you to look outside of your Sunday evening. I have the girls for an hour, and then they go. On Sunday morning, when your girls walk in, are you smiling at them? Are you taking time to talk to them? Do you know about their life? Do you know what's going on in their home? Do you know what's happening with that girl at school right now? Or do you know what's happening in her friendships? That's an important piece. That gives you the right to speak into her life. Just because you're the one that is her STARS teacher or her PRIMS teacher does not necessarily give you the right to disciple her. She'll sit there and she'll listen to you and she'll do her work because she's a girl, because that's what usually little girls will do. She'll sit and do that, but you haven't necessarily earned the right to speak into her life, and that's what discipleship is about. When we're following Jesus, we need to be discipling others. And so you, as a girls' ministries leader, have the opportunity and the privilege and the responsibility to have a relationship with that girl so that you can disciple her. And intentionally reaching out to these girls. I know you have girls in this community. I know in Bath you have girls in that community that don't know anything about Jesus. They don't know anything. You have friends of your girls that are coming. You have maybe friends that you know that have children that are not coming, that need to come. You have children just in the community. We want to give you tools and resources to reach out to those girls and develop relationships with you, with them. And that's part of the resources and um, the biblical um, curriculum that we have. And our vision is to see every girl moving toward a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the first thing. The second thing is to empower girls to realize their importance and their potential in the kingdom of God. That was a huge piece for me as a teenager. Was I had women that did speak into my life that showed me that what, I was an important piece, that I didn't have to wait until I was um, out of high school, that I could make an impact on the kingdom of God where I was. I could help with this, or I could teach that, or I could learn this piece, or I could use my gifts here. I was a piece and a part of that, and I believe that that's a huge reason why I'm in ministry today is because those women um, showed me that. And we want to see in the future girls and leaders uh, forming lasting, life-changing relationships. Do any of you have, and I'd like to take a moment for you to share, do any of you have stories of either girls that you've mentored or a woman who mentored you that you still have a relationship with that had an impact on you? Yes. that work together, um, and I remember their names to this day. I'm 74, and this was back when I was three or four, and going on, not right on, uh, um, they were Raina Burgess and, um, oh my goodness, the other one just died recently, but they're both gone now.
patients for oh my gosh, I just wrote that down. But I kind of heard this. Um, 432. Be kind one to another. I mean, and you wanted to say it the way the Bible used to say it. That's the only Bible we had to go by then. And uh, uh, but I learned it better by saying it with all of these and the vowels and everything. I don't know why I did it. So those, those two women invested in you. And you, still, and you said something very profound there. You said that you knew you had a safe place yeah. when you came to them. Yes. Very profound. Was that great? Uh, my mom, she was the Christian, but it always hard for the father to and uh, but I I don't remember this. My mom and I the one who used to be all in church every time the doors were open. And uh, it was it was a wonderful place to be. And everybody loved you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what we want to hear our that's what we want our girls to feel. We want them to feel what was safe when I was with when I was in the church. It was, I, I could tell that teacher, I could tell that sponsor anything. I could tell that lady anything. I, I could tell her anything and she wouldn't judge me. She wouldn't think bad of me. I could go there and I was accepted and I was loved. That's the bottom line. That's what we want to see happening. Anybody else have a story, either of a girl that you mentored or somebody who mentored you? Anybody else? You know, we want these girls to have that kind of relationship with us where we're not just confined to that one hour or that 45 minutes or whatever it is that we have during that time. That's important time, but we want to have that kind of relationship. And honestly, in today's day and age with technology and with social media and with, with email and texting and all of these things, we have those opportunities that we can have those kind of relationships with girls. I have interns in girls' ministries now. I have um, usually six or seven interns at once they're either high school seniors or college age girls or actually at this point I have two girls who are actually in ministry I have one who is a children's pastor and I have one who um, has been doing internships um, missions internships so those are my those are my interns and I have a relationship with them I check on them regularly they are all over the place one's in North Carolina you know two are in two or three are in New York City um, you know one's in I don't know where she is right now. I think she was back in Watertown. I don't know where she is. But they're kind of all over. But I check in on them on a regular basis. I watch their Facebook. I watch their Twitter. I see what they're doing. And I try to encourage them and speak into their lives. Not where I'm like, uh, 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 I don't want to see you doing that. But if I see something, I talk to them about it. And in the same way, I know that I'm accountable to them. And how I behave impacts them. And that's another piece, is our responsibility. You know, it's a privilege that we have here, but we have a responsibility when we're looking at the future of these girls and showing them that they have a place in ministry, they have a place in the church, they're important. Whether that means that they do become children's pastors in North Carolina, or they get married and have four children and they're ministering to that family. It's all the same that level of leadership and that level of ministry that they have. But we have a responsibility to hold ourselves to a standard as well. Who we are here is the same person that we are there. And uh, because you know what? Kids smell that a mile away. They do. They, they smell fake a mile away. They know it's there. 
our values, and these are the core values that we want to see in every church that has girls' ministries. First of all, Holy Spirit guidance. Uh, you know, we believe in Pentecostal ministry. We believe in being guided by the Holy Spirit and his leading. Uh, second, servant ministry, where we are serving these girls. It's not about us. It's not about us. Um, you know, I know that in girls' ministries, we have badges and we have accomplishments and we have honor stars and we have girls-only graduates and badges and medals and all of those things, and those things are great. But I have seen sometimes those things become a tool for a teacher to feel good about her own leadership. And that is something that I don't ever want to see in a church. And if I see it, I will call it out. Um, because that hurts the girls. If the girls feel like they're just there and they're your dancing bear for the night, um, and you're, that's your expectation of them rather than the relationship, those things are good. I'm not saying anything bad about them. I'm the girls' ministries director, so obviously, you know, I love to put a crown on a girl's head, and I love to put a sash around a girl's neck, but it's more important that our hearts are servants and we're ministering to those girls in that way, not because we can say, look, I had five honor stars. Enough on that. Cultural relevance. Um, you know, we do seek to, to constantly know what's going on in our culture. And right now, cultural relevance is a moving target. What is relevant right now is not relevant now. It's just like that. So that's constant, and we're working to get to that place where we're constantly giving you resources and information and um, studies and curriculum that helps you um, target that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Teamwork and cooperation. This is why I'm here, and this is why we have two churches represented here. We work together. We're not in competition with one another. It's not about which church is doing this and that church is doing that. We want to see there are plenty of girls to go around, um, and so we want to work together to accomplish that. And also within the local church, working together as a team. What does that look like for you? Does it mean sometimes that... Um, we have to look at what wasn't working in the past and ditch it. Sometimes that's difficult, especially like, you know, for me, I'm a, I'm a traditionalist. I'm a creature of habit. I have Mennonite roots. I know you're in a Mennonite Amish community. I have Mennonite roots. And so for me, I like things that are more traditional and more simple, and I like things a certain way. But sometimes that doesn't work. And what worked five years ago or 10 years ago or definitely 20 years ago is not necessarily what's going to work now. So sometimes that's a hard thing in a church, to take what isn't working, to pull it up, to look at it, sit down as a group, pray together, spend time together, and say, okay, let's work together as a team here, and let's identify what we need. The first thing we need is we need to know that we're discipling girls, and we're showing them the way to Jesus. The next thing we need to know is that we are showing these girls that they're loved and accepted and they're important. Okay, so once we start drilling down to those things and working together as a team and it's no longer about what we used to do or what kind of program we have or look at our curriculum or how many honor stars we have up here. Now it's about working together as a team because we want to show our girls that that's what the church is. We're not about ourselves. We're about working together for the kingdom and for accomplishing his goal. And Christ-like character is a piece of that. We want to make sure that as we follow Jesus, we should be starting to look like him. Not because we're intentionally trying to look like him, but because we're following him, we start to look like him. Have you ever seen those pictures of the dogs and their owners that look like each other? Because <laughs> they spend so much time together, like the lady looks like the Shih Tzu after a while, and the guy looks like the Basset Hound. Like, I guess that's a bad example. But anyway, the more that we spend time with Jesus, I should have warned you, too, I have, like, undiagnosed, untreated ADD. So I will go down a rabbit hole, and pretty soon my husband will go. So then I have <laughs> to come back. I'll go down a rabbit hole. But the more time we spend with Jesus, the more we'll look like him. The more we'll look like him. It's not contrived, it's not forced. And you know what? The girls will be attracted to that. So I want to talk a little bit about leadership, and I want to talk about the resources that we have. Obviously, we want to develop leaders who will personify the Titus II principle. That's women mentoring girls. Minister to girls in a holistic manner, where we're thinking about their little hearts and their little minds and the things that they're worried about. I love nothing more than a little daisy coming into prayer time and asking for prayer for a boo-boo. 
and the teacher getting down with that little girl and laying her hands on that boo-boo and praying for that girl. That's holistic ministry where we're understanding that at her age level that is so important to her. That's more important than world hunger and war. That boo-boo is the most important thing to that little girl at that moment, and that teacher gets that at that moment. That's holistic ministry. And we're worried about what's going on in their world today. What's impacting their minds? What's impacting their hearts? What's impacting their bodies and their health? Those are things that we're worried about. We want you as leaders to guide and challenge girls towards emotional and spiritual maturity. In order to do that, we have to work on being emotionally and spiritually mature ourselves. So you see, the deeper our relationship is with Christ, and the more that we are maturing, the better we'll be as we lead these girls. And we should be challenging them to that. We should be challenging them to hold themselves to a higher standard as they follow Jesus. Not because they're following after a form of godliness or a set of rules and regulations, but because they're following him and they're an example. And then we should be propelling them to impact their world, giving them opportunities to tell others about Jesus, showing them what that looks like, encouraging them as they do that. My son, and this is ironic, by the way. You know, I don't have girls. I have two little boys. But those little boys are going to get married someday. And so I'm going to (laughs) pick. All the girls in New York State get to pick two girls for my boys. But my, (laughs) that's the idea. Right, I know, I know. I, I have it worked out in my mind. It's perfect. Couldn't be better. Anyway, we're going to go to Kleinfeld's. We're going to pick out the dress together. I got it all figured out. Anyway, um, my son, my oldest son, Caleb, my little angel, um, has a a friend in school, and he's been talking about this friend and how he so desperately wants him to know who Jesus is and how he's he's looking for opportunities and he's strategically placing himself in places. I'm so proud of that, you know? He's, he's learning that. He's understanding that because he has leaders in his life and mentors in his life that have shown him that. That's what we want our girls to do. You know, it's not necessarily that they're going to Walmart and handing out tracts. I don't know that that works anymore. It works maybe once in a great while. But what works is when girls have a relationship with somebody else and they tell them about Jesus through their lives and through their actions and then for their, through their love. And you want to challenge them to do that. Some of the resources that we offer to you, you know, I was talking about relevance, and that's a big piece. When you have a curriculum, it's a big piece to keep that curriculum relevant, Um, especially once it's been printed or publicized or distributed because things change. Um, Looking into the curriculum, we were just talking about this this weekend, there are things in the curriculum, especially for the older girls, not as much for the little ones, but for the older girls that are dated and don't seem as relevant anymore. Um, So if you notice that, and I would encourage you, this is another piece in mentoring, bring somebody of the younger generation alongside of you to speak critically into what you're doing and put on your armor and be ready to be harmed a little bit by it. But that's one of the reasons why I have interns because the interns will tell me, don't do that. That is lame. It is stupid. Don't do it. I remember I said something. We were in a. I have a group chat set up for my um, for my interns on Facebook. So I said something. I can't remember what it was, and one of the girls said, "Please don't ever say that again." <laughs> so okay. I thought I sounded great. I was like, I said I made some. I can't remember what it was. She said, "Don't say that again." You sound you sound really old. I said, okay, I won't do it again. But um, we, we keep things, um, we're trying to get internet resources for you, and these are free resources. So when you go on the National Girls Ministries website, it's ngm.ag.org. Um, ngm.ag.org. I don't think it's on there. Um, If you go to the AG website, just ag.org, you eventually can get there, but this is easier. Um, There's a teen girl section, and if you go to the teen girl section, you can drop down to um, podcasts, I think are on on there, but there are hot topics on there, and I'll probably go into those a little more. But as um, issues seem to come to the forefront of this generation, we have teen girl specialists and theologians who are writing uh, studies on those issues. So you can use those. So if you know that there's an issue um, with homosexuality in your area, 
and believe me, there is. There just there is. Um, you can talk about that because girls have questions. They're being told something and it's not true. Um, and if you have, you know, if you want to talk about dating, there's stuff on there about dating. There's stuff about. <laughs> recently, I did a, a study on the Twilight series which is not so big now, um, but it was big a few years ago, and really my big concern with that wasn't even the vampires and the werewolves and all that stuff. I was more concerned about the emotionally abusive relationship that was being outlined in this book, and so that was a piece that I used to tantalize the girls to come to my workshop. I'm talking about Twilight, so all the, you know, all the Team Edward and the, and the Team Jacob showed up in their t-shirts and everything, and then I talked about the unhealthy relationship in Twilight and why it wasn't something that we find in the Word of God. So it gave me an opportunity to talk about that. So you can look actually really relevant and really cool and you know, really up to date with these, with these resources, and they're biblically based, and there are scripture upon scripture upon scripture that you can use, and you can use them as studies. Um, there are newsletters and forums and podcasts there, too. There are also um, leadership development books. There's a basic leadership training, and I don't know how many of you have had the chance to take that. There's a book. Um, you can take that independently. I can come and teach it. Um, I have other leaders who can come and teach it. There's also a DVD that you can use when you teach it, but it basically goes through the nuts and bolts of girls' ministries in the curriculum, and you're, some of you are nodding your head. You've already taken it. talks about learning styles for the ages. That's there, but there's also further development books, um, things, and um, they're called, I wish I could remember now. I think it's community, church, and something else, um, but they're in that same place on the GPH store as the other ones are, and some of the um, topics are mentoring, understanding learning styles, blending the generations, managing conflict, building a biblical worldview. They're very challenging, um, and actually the one on the generations rocked my world when I took that one. I was like, oh, all these things that we had been struggling with in church ministry, all of a sudden I understood what was happening. Really good, really good training material. Um, and the clubs, you kind of probably already know about the clubs here in your church. What, what, what clubs are you currently running here in Penyon? Are you? And stars, okay. And then you're looking at probably blending a little bit of Primsy Starsy or Daisy Primsy. stars and up. Okay. And they're probably going to do sort of a together with Rangers plan right now because these two right now are it. So we're going to be working on that. And that's something that you can do too. But I do encourage you to always break off for that gender specific ministry time because that's important. That mentoring piece is very important. But you can work together for part of it and then break off for the other part and I can help you do that. But there, you know there are clubs available. Now there's Sunlight Kids, which I don't know if you've had a chance to see that. That is the cutest curriculum ever. Um, and it's nursery age curriculum. You know, we, we hear from educators and from, um, from medical people and from people in child development that babies learn in the womb. And yet in the church we stick them in a nursery and let them eat Nilla wafers and Cheerios for an hour and a half. So the idea here is that they're learning in the cradle, and they can learn. And it's constant reinforcement of simple Bible verses and simple concepts, and obviously they're not going to recite a memory verse and, and do all that, but they are going to hear the word of God, and I feel like that's important. So we have resources that go all the way through 12th grade for you. Um, in, the in the preschool clubs, um, it's a little more... Um, I think it's a little more stable as far as, far as relevance goes. I don't think, um, for the most part, that you have to worry so much about the resources that are being given to you. Um, because little kids aren't facing, well, some of them are, but they aren't facing as many of the issues that we're seeing in our tweens and teens, and because it's very basic. Um, all of this curriculum is age appropriate. It was written um, between childhood development educators and theologians. They work together on these pieces, so they're um, really well done and they're really spot on. Um, so you can do a uh, unit memory verse every unit, every four weeks. They, they learn a memory verse. They learn a central truth. There's guided play. There's hands-on activity. Really cute and fun stuff in there. I also want to tell you that I think all of the um, leadership resources are available on CD now, CD-ROM. So you can take that and you can upload it, download it, print it, not print it. Whatever you want to do, you don't have to bring that 48,000-page stars binder back and forth with you to church. Um, 
And also, you feel free to use stuff. I know that there are people that get like all wound up in that in that curriculum and they're worried that they have to do everything that's in that lesson. Those are suggestions. You don't have to do everything that's in there. Um, if you come in and you're just worried about checking a bunch of stuff off your list, the girls are going to, they're gone. They're gone. Yeah, they're checked out. Um, also, we have a nationwide sleepover, which I don't hold a district sleepover, but did you get a sleepover packet in the mail? Did, did you get one a CD? Did, did one come here to the church? Did you, did you guys get one in Bath? You can go online and download everything. You can do that. You can do that as a one-night event, or you can actually hold it as a sleepover. The idea of that is to raise money for Coins for Kids, which this year our project is um, China Orphan Care. So the money that's raised on a national level and on a district level is going um, for an orphanage in China. There are, are videos online that you can watch. There's a leader's DVD for you to, or video for you to see, and then there's one that you can show the girls that has a little less information in it. Basically, these are, chil th these are children that in this orphanage, children were dying daily in this orphanage because there were no medical resources for them. Uh, these are kids that are like dropped off. You know in China, um, there's a lot of cast off children, especially if they're girls, um, especially if a girl has any kind of physical defect or physical disability, they're not kept. Um, and because of the population control there, children are not valued at all. So um, these missionaries, and they, I don't know where they are in China. China is a close country. We don't know where they are. Um, but they have actually taken this orphanage, brought in nurses, brought in medical staff. Um, and the staff is all nationals. They're all Chinese, and actually they've all gotten saved as a result of, of the ministry there. But children are not dying on a regular basis there. Um, they're being cared for, they're being held, they're being taken care of. So um, girls instantly kind of understand the idea of a child who isn't, isn't well and is in a home that she needs to be cared for. So you can use these pieces. The sleepover information is really cute. It's kind of panda bear, Chinese bamboo, really cute stuff. And you can use that as a kickoff if you want for your school year. You could do a one-night thing where we're, we're doing this, you know, um, we're doing China night or whatever, decorate with Chinese lanterns with little umbrellas. And then any money that's raised that night, if you send it through me, it goes through the district and then I send it off to Coins for Kids. So every year there's a, there's a, different, uh, there's a different project. Next year it's Bangladesh. So every year there's a different project. And that's Coins for Kids. The idea is to get girls understanding missions giving and how important it is to give outside of ourselves. And then teen girl um, information, there's a teen girl retreat. If you're looking at a teen girl piece for you, um, this is free. There are four on the website now. I have used two of them. Um, they're really good. You can do them as a one day, an overnight, a two day. You can take and, and, and use and discard. Um, the one that I used recently, Lost and Found, about girls developing an evangelistic heart and developing their own testimony, powerful and really good stuff. Um, at the end of the time that we had together, the girls actually shared their testimony with another girl and, and learned how to do that, how to phrase her testimony, um, what had happened to her in such a way that she could tell somebody what Jesus had done for her. So... Um, Really powerful piece, and sometimes in church we think our kids are going to get that through osmosis because we know it, and they don't get it through osmosis. They have to be taught just like we were. Um, so you can do that. Um, also on there, I talked about the hot topics. Those are there, and those are being updated on a regular basis. Those are two-page um, things for the leader. So there's a leader piece and there's a girl piece. So when you um, print it off, you would print out, you can print out the handout for the girls or you don't have to give it to them if you don't want to. And then you can use your leader piece. Very interactive, very discussion based, tons and tons of scripture verses. I encourage you to like distribute the scripture verses ahead of time and have the girls ready to read those. Um, so we're here. I'm here as a district coordinator to help you. Uh, the national office is here to help you. We want to give you resources and we want to give you training. But most of all, we want to just inspire you to mentor girls. Whatever that looks like for you. If the resources are feeling constricting for, to, for you or if they feel like they're crushing for you, then I can help you pare that down 
in such a way that the resource is not the issue because the resource should not be the issue. We want to help you mentor girls and see them thrive. That's what we want to see you do. You know, I have my, my star, my little star story, and I'm just going to share that with you as I close. One of my interns, um, she's a PK, um, and she and her family have been through a lot in the last few years, a lot of things have happened in her life. And um, so she became an intern for me the first year that I had interns, which I think was five years ago. The reason why I started having interns was our retreat got so big as an event that my team and I couldn't run it. And so we thought, well, how are we going to get people to work for free? Because we're, they're working for free, and how do we get them to work for free? So we were trying to figure out what to do, and we came up with all these different ideas, and somebody said, you know what we need? We need slaves. And I said, we can't use that word. We can't do that. That's not appropriate. So one of the girls said, you know what? Let's do this. I know this girl, and I'll bet she would she would come and help. You know, she's solid. She's a senior. She's doing really well. So what we started doing is we started identifying a few girls that we thought, you know, we knew them, we had a relationship with them, and we thought that they would come, and they had different skill sets, and they could come and help us. So it grew into this whole little subculture in girls' ministries. And so these girls have relationships with each other. They come to my event every year. They work their little fingers to the bone. They run my graphics. They run my video. Um, they, they run the games for the teenage girls. They teach sessions. I give them topics, and they teach sessions. And so they're in, in turn mentoring the girls underneath them. And they're also reverse mentoring me because, like I said, they tell me when something is stupid. They're not afraid to tell me, don't do that. Um, or that doesn't look right, um, you're dated, let me take it. You know, they all have, you know, way more technology than I have, and they will fix it and make it look the right way. Um, this year they organized a flash mob. Like, we did all kinds of, we, we just do really fun stuff because they're there, that stuff that I could never pull off at that event. So any, one, one of the girls is a PK, and she really has a heart for missions, but she's extremely introverted, extremely introverted. Um, really smart girl, you know, anointed. She loves Jesus with all her heart, has tons of talents, um, great graphic artist, um, really good with social media and with, with um, web design, but she's very introverted. So I had no idea. She wrote me this whole letter. She asked me to do, she asked me to do a reference for her, which I did, but she wrote me this whole letter. And she said, you know, I knew that God had called me to the mission field, but I had no idea how I could possibly do that. And then Lisa asked me to come to her retreat and be an intern. She said, so the first year I basically just ran to Walmart for her, which she did. You know, at 2 in the morning I was like, can you go to Walmart? We don't have any more bottled water. So, of course, they're willing to go. They, have, they don't care if they sleep or not. I'm going to bed. They're going to Walmart. And, she's, and the first year, you know, she did this, she did that. But as the years progressed, I gave more and more responsibility to her. And so it got to the point where last year she was teaching her own breakout session with teen girls about missions. And she is now, she, was an, she did an internship last year in Panama. She said, I never could have imagined myself coming out of my shell to the point where I would put myself out there, apply for an internship, interview for an internship, and then actually go and lead a teen girl conference in Panama. So those are the kinds of things that happen when we mentor girls. It's not just about them getting a badge. It's not about them getting a crown. It's not about them completing a unit or learning a memory verse. We want them to learn the word of God. It's important. We want them to be able to tell their story about Jesus, but we especially want them to grow into godly young women who do whatever it is God wants them to do. And when we mentor them and show them and then show them that we have confidence in them and that what they're doing is we're here, we're supporting you, but eventually they're going to fly and do it on their own. So that's what I want to see happen in every girls' ministries in every church in the New York district, that we have Stephanie stories, that we have stories about girls who now, because of what happened with their leaders in girls' ministries, are going out and making an impact on their world. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. I thank you for these women here, and I see their heart for girls as we're talking, Lord. I see the burdens on their faces, Lord, and their desire, Lord, to see girls changed and their lives redirected. God, I just pray a special blessing on these two churches, Lord. 
you know the nuts and the bolts and you know the ins and the outs of the dynamics of that community lord you know the um the inner workings of the relationships lord but when we all when we drill it down it all comes to following you and bringing others alongside us as we do that Lord, I pray for these girls, each girl represented in this room, Lord, the target audience that is in the mind of these women right now. Lord, I pray for the future leaders in these churches, Lord. I pray for the future pastor's wives, the future missionaries, Lord, the future teachers, the future doctors, lawyers, nurses, businesswomen, moms, lovers of babies, Lord. I just pray, Lord God, that you would touch these girls even now. God, that you would do a work in their lives and in their little hearts even now. God, that when they come into these club rooms, Lord, they would feel loved, they would feel accepted, and they would know, they would know who they are in you. Lord, help us as women to put aside our own baggage, our own insecurities, our own preconceived ideas, Lord, and drill down to the fact that you love us just because you made us, Lord. And let us make that our priority to place in the hearts of these girls, Lord, that they would understand who they are in you and that that would enable them and empower them to do great things for you. In Jesus' name, amen.